Hey everyone, so for this video, I am going to be talking about attentional bias and anxiety. So let's just jump right in. Most of this information is going to be from our Barham and colleagues article in 2007. And I'm going to provide that reference at the end of this presentation. But I wanted to introduce some key concepts before we really get into what they did in their meta-analysis study. So let's talk about attentional bias and anxiety. Attention bias in brief is basically the concept that someone is going to pay more attention to certain information than other information. So in anxiety in particular, it is thought that people with anxiety are gonna pay more attention more quickly and possibly have more trouble disengaging from information that is threatening. So what do we mean by that? So this is a quick example. If we were to show this image to someone um, or use it in a study, the thought is, is that someone with anxiety or high, higher levels of anxiety is going to notice the more negative or threatening face quicker than someone who doesn't have anxiety. Um, and so that's, that's kind of what we're in a nutshell talking about here. So this concept actually relates to some different cognitive theories. There's this concept of schemas, which in short is basically beliefs that we have about ourselves, about the world, about others, things that we just are believing and thinking patterns that we have. And so some researchers think that basically people with anxiety have thought processes or thought patterns that are more attuned with threat or more focused on threatening information. And some researchers think that that happens early and later on after they see threatening information. Some researchers think that it's because they're avoiding or again, that they're having difficulty disengaging. So there's different beliefs about all of the details in regards to this. So you may be wondering why are there some different beliefs in regards to this? Well, Barr, Hyman and colleagues, again, we're gonna go into that meta-analysis in just a moment, but basically what they were proposing is that a lot of these differences in what we're finding in regards to attention bias and anxiety is it due to differences in how attention bias is being researched. So we've got some researchers who are looking at how anxious people in a group within themselves are looking at threatening versus neutral pictures or words. And then we've got people who are also comparing an anxious group to a control group. We also have researchers who are recruiting people for their studies that actually have diagnoses of anxiety disorders and some who are recruiting people who just self-report that they have high levels of anxiety using different self-assessment measures. And then we've also got this difference between state versus straight trait anxiety. So state anxiety is kind of like feeling anxious in the moment and some situations are gonna trigger anxiety in most people. And then some uh, and researchers are also looking at trait anxiety, meaning more long-term kind of personality characteristics that would indicate someone is more anxious. We've got this concept of comorbidity as well. Some researchers are thoroughly screening out and making sure that people that they're researching um, have anxiety, but also don't have other mental health or health concerns such as depression, um, which is often goes along with anxiety, depression and anxiety are often comorbid is kind of what this term is referring to here. And then there's also researchers looking at youth, but also researchers looking at adults. So you can see we've got a lot of variability here. So a lot of differences going on. And this visual here just kind of shows us that if a researcher is using more of this strategy, they're gonna have a control group, meaning someone who's not, you know, a group of people who aren't reporting anxiety versus an experiment group, meaning we want to see what's going on with people who have anxiety and then compare it to. Here's some more differences that, is, that, that Barheim and colleagues point out is that um, researchers are using different tasks. They're programming different computer tasks or some people even these days are using smartphones um, to create these attention bias tasks to assess the attentional bias. And sometimes the task is using subliminal um, information, meaning like the, that a picture or a word is gonna be on the screen so quickly that it doesn't consciously process uh, for the person. And some people are using just entirely different tasks to assess for attention bias, which we're gonna go into in just in detail in just a moment. And then we've got people using words and then people using other types of stimuli like pictures of 
scenes or faces. So let's kind of just get right into these different types of tasks that researchers are using. So we've got people using the emotional stroop, which as you can see, it's basically asking a participant to look at words. And then what they're asked to do is identify the color of the word that they saw. And someone with anxiety is more likely to notice these words and kind of be more in tune. And as some researchers were saying, even potentially have difficulty disengaging from that word. And um, that, so that's gonna impact how they respond to what color the word is. Then here's an example of a dot probe where basically a participant's going to be asked to look at two different images or words side by side, and then asked to respond to a target after viewing the stimulus. So, um, so basically the thought is that the difference in their response to the target in terms of how quickly they respond to the target after viewing the stimuli is going to differ based on whether the stimuli they just saw were th was threatening or neutral. And then last but not least, here's that emotional spatial cueing example. And this is basically focused on the space of where on the screen, what did the person see the stimulus? So in this example, someone saw a more threatening face a blank screen and then we're asked to identify which side of the screen was that more threatening face on and so a valid trial would be that they chose the right side and an invalid trial would be that they chose the wrong side the the incorrect side of where it was at so those are all the differences that barheim and colleagues highlighted in terms of what's going on with research related to attention bias and anxiety their ultimate goal, because they had noticed all these articles popping up, um, looking at attention bias and anxiety, their ultimate goal was to look at all of these articles and perform what's called a meta-analysis. And that's basically where you look at all the articles that are related to the same concept and you, you throw them together. And in this case, they coded them and they thoroughly looked at and researched and then analyzed how big is this effect? How strong of a finding is this across the literature up until 2005, because um, that's that was their cutoff date is to look up to, to 2005. So they wanted to look at all of these articles and they ended up including 172 articles, which had quite a few, as you can see, 2,263 anxious uh, compared to 1,768 non-anxious participants. So they looked at all of these studies together, included them based on this criteria that it had to be in English, it had to use one of three of these um, attention bias uh, tasks, and then they, they did want to make sure that the, whoever the researcher was did report a threatening versus neutral stimulus um, response rate, and then they also wanted to include studies that had anxious samples, um, and also they needed the effect sides to be reported. So they coded those and performed this kind of big analysis to see overall what's going on here. And their final results showed that anxious adults and children did show a threat related bias. And it didn't matter if the people had a diagnosis or if it was self-reported high anxiety levels, uh, the, the threat related bias was still there. And for the studies that included a non-anxious control group, they did not show that same attention bias to threat. So in other words, this finding of attention bias to threat, they found was, as you could say, leg legitimate. The, and and it, it, it was going on and it was significantly different than non-anxious groups. They looked at subliminal versus conscious or superliminal um, stimuli. So the people who put the stimuli on the screen really quick versus not. Um, so the how long the stimulus was on the screen. And they did not find a significant difference. They did find that the more conscious um, uh, stimulus duration on the screen was slightly larger, but they, um, but it was not significant. So it wasn't sig different enough to be a significant difference. Task type, they did find that the dot probe task and the emotional stroop were the most, uh, had the largest effect or were, were the most, seemed to be the most effective. But they did also highlight that for the emotional spatial cueing task, that they only had four articles that had actually used it. So in a way, it, it seemed like they were saying it maybe wasn't a fair comparison. And as far as the stimuli, words versus pictures versus pictures of faces, 
they didn't find any significant difference there. So it didn't matter if researchers were using words, pictures, uh, pictures of faces, pictures of scenery, um, there was no significant difference there. So I'm not gonna go over this model in depth, but I did wanna highlight that this is in the article that I'm about to share the reference, about, uh, reference with you about. Um, but they did create an integrative model because at the beginning of this video, we talked about how there's cognitive theories and that's also led some people to create different models of attentional bias and anxiety. And Bar Hyman colleagues basically, at, you know, in the end of their results said that there wasn't a model at that time out there that really fully explained what they were finding in their meta-analysis. So they proposed this model of attentional bias to basically kind of show the cognitive mechanisms underlying the attentional bias to threat and how that's being processed. So you can kind of go through this as a pretty neat visual um, that you can refer back to in the article itself. Um, and I'm gonna put that reference up here right now. You can access this article online and um, I'm gonna put the reference on here. And in conclusion, they basically recommended that research still continue, that people still continue to study this, especially the differences between adults and children. And they also proposed that, yes, it is interesting that attentional bias is associated with anxiety, but they also challenged researchers to look at the why, um, what, what might be driving this attention bias to um, to threatening information for people with anxiety. So they also had that challenge at the end of their article, just encouraging researchers to continue to look, continue to look for answers and continue to do refined research with clear procedures that can be replicated. So this is, um, this is a super helpful article if you want to learn more about attentional bias and anxiety. I just was hitting some of the highlights. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week and take care. Thank you.